I said that this is an annual lecture, but we were unable to stage the event last year because, well, you guessed it, because of COVID. COVID is like an unwelcome guest who comes into your house and refuses to move out and who has stayed too long. We shall be glad to see the back of it. But we are very happy to be able to stage the lecture this year and just thrilled to use a lecture to commemorate over 50 years teaching West Indian literature at the UWI Mona. In 1969, the first full one-year course in West Indian literature was offered at UWI Mona, taught by Professor Kenneth Ramchand. More broadly, Professor Ramchand was instrumental in decolonizing the UWI literature curriculum and establishing West Indian literature as central to the UWI curriculum at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. We're fortunate to have him here today to speak to us and we thank him heartily for agreeing to do so. Last week, the department held a series of lecture presentations intended to assist Cape literature students prepare for their exams. In one of the presentations, Ms. Whitney Eaton, a postgraduate student, a postgraduate student in the department, framed her discussion by thinking back to what she would have most wanted from her teachers when she was studying for CAPE exams. Unlike Ms. Eaton, I studied literature in sixth form several decades ago. But her comments got me thinking of those long ago school days when we did overseas rather than local exams. And the writers that we studied for literature were mostly dead, none of them from the Caribbean or even remotely connected to the Caribbean. And I remember quite clearly when my sixth form literature teacher informed the class that dialect was a good tool for conveying humor, but could not communicate subtlety and complexity, as if humor could not also be subtle and complex. But of course, the larger implication of that remark was that the language we used every day among ourselves was not sufficient. It was not somehow good enough. Two of the lecture presentations we had left last week for our CAPE series indicate just how far we have come on the journey of studying our own literature and teaching our own literature. And by extension, studying the Caribbean. One of those presentations was a conversation between two poets, Lorna Goodison, whose collection Selected Poems is on the Cape Literatures in English syllabus, and Tanya Shirley, now a lecturer in the department and whose work we study in some of our poetry, poetry courses, and whose work I am sure will one day be studied by Cape students, and, and I'm sure that they will enjoy that. Listening to that interview, I marveled at what insight into the poetry that discussion would provide for listening students and how it would help them connect the words on the page to things they saw every day all around them. But also I thought about how that conversation might change their concept of who a poet is and could be. Maybe one of those Cape students sitting somewhere in some small corner of the region, listening to the interview, and reading Lord Goodison's poem, might be able to believe that he or she could also be a poet. Another of the Cape sessions involved a discussion of a 2014 production of the Dennis Scott play, An Echo in the Bone. That presentation was organized by Carolyn Allen, a former lecturer in the department and a graduate as well, and someone who I can only describe as, as a theater person. She directs, produces, acts, things, mentors, you name it. The other person in the conversation was Mr. Eugene Williams, who directed that 2014 production. Eugene is a former director of the drama school at the Edna Manley School of the Visual and Performing Arts, a post that was also held by Dennis Scott, who taught Eugene at Edna Manley. And to make that circle complete, Scott was one of the students who sat in Professor Ramchand's first class in West Indian literature here at Mona. The teaching of West Indian literature can be understood as a journey to understanding ourselves and valuing ourselves. We thank and honor those who have brought us thus far. We continue to travel the course 
with your support. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, let me ask Ms. Lisa Brown, lecturer in the Department of Literatures in English, and one of the lecturers who teaches several West Indian courses, West Indian literature courses in the department to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Kenneth Ramchand. The Department of Literatures in English is honored and very pleased to have Professor Emeritus from the University St. Augustine campus deliver the 14th Edward Ball Distinguished Lecture. Professor Ramchand is the author of the groundbreaking text, The West Indian Novel and Its Background, published in 1970. This text provided the critical blueprint for the growth and development of over 50 years of creative and critical scholarship on the region's literary arts. In the original preface, Professor Ramchand notes, I can only hope that the present work will play a useful part in the years ahead of discovery, evaluation and reorientation in the West Indies. 51 years after that expression, we can all agree that the work of generations of students and scholars of this text has far exceeded these modest expectations. Professor Ramchand's extensive body of critical essays have appeared in Caribbean Quarterly, the Journal of West Indian Literature, Siwani Review, and Ariel, a review of international English literature among others. He has published two other works on West Indian literature, West Indian Narrative, 19, 1966, and an introduction to the study of West Indian literature in 1976. He is presently working on his selected essays and a memoir of his life in academy and society. Professor Ramchand's Pub record of public service extends beyond the academy to include terms as an independent senator in the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and as an author of a weekly column, Matters Arising for the Trinidad Guardian. After his retirement from UAE in 1999, he served as vice provost and later returning to academy president of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. For his contribution to the development of culture, education and the arts, Professor Ramchand has received several prestigious awards. In 1996, he received the Jaconia Medal Gold from the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And in 2012, the National Library of Trinidad awarded him the NALIS Lifetime Literary Achievement Award. In 2014, he received the Bocas Henry Swansea Award for Distinguished Service to Caribbean Letters. Please join me in welcoming the first professor of West Indian Literature, Professor Emeritus Kenneth Ramchand, to deliver the lecture. Professor Ramchand, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And thanks for that very warm introduction. Members of the Department of Literatures in English, Professor Emeritus's and other distinguished listeners, I am grateful to Literatures in English for inviting me to deliver the Edward Bohr Distinguished Lecture on the subject, 50 years of teaching West Indian literature at the University of the West Indies. These 50 years run in close parallel with 50 years of my life. I've resigned three times and retired twice, but I have never left. This has been my life. And if at any point, some jumbie had taken me up to the heights of Irish Town, 
and said unto me, Stop reading books and talking about books, and we will make you Usain Bolt. I would have staggered a little and then said, Get thee behind me, Satan. I can't avoid the intimacy that exists between my whole life and the career of teaching literature at the university. My talk is divided into seven parts. The first part is titled, After the Event. As we move through the other six parts, I will take notice of falling undergraduate student numbers here as in other parts of the world. And in passing, I will try to see how we might account for this shift at our university, not forgetting that unfortunately, we are not and never have been islands unto ourselves. We have never been left in peace to get on with our business of becoming without being genocided, enslaved, indentured, colonized, merged with the lumpen pro proletariat of the global village, or infiltrated by the theory-infested talking heads of the PhD factories. In the closing part of my presentation, I want to come after the event, as it were, and ask what it means to teach literature in general, and what particularly it means to teach West Indian literature to West Indians. So before I continue, I better say right now that as a teacher of literature and as a critic, I have always seen it as my function to bring forward the names of books and writers, to make available from my research and experience any information that would clear away the obstacles to reading and to make the writings themselves available for readers to feel and see for themselves. There are lots of other things that critics scholars and teachers may usefully do, but I have never lost sight of what I consider to be my profession's simple primary function. So that's the end of after the event. The second section is called grounding. And why it's called grounding will become evident. I wish this lecture could have been live and I could be on the Mona campus again, where so many things and people helped to grow my consciousness and to make me clarify what I was about as a reader of literature and a teacher of literature. Jamaica was the first island in which I lived and worked upon returning from study and teaching abroad. A wire fence separated our house from that, that of George Beckford. My children went through the fence to play with his children, and I very often slipped over to join in the Appleton and in the noisy, radical discussions of university and society that went on in the crowded veranda. Beckford made me see how sublimated my politics was in my criticism. Too sublimated, perhaps. Beckford made me understand, in scientific terms, the profundity of the bonds and the pity of the ruptures that had been socially engineered in the modern age between literature, culture, and society. I don't think he ever read Foucault, but in his backyard, 
He gave Caribbean flesh and blood to all the elements in the order of things that Foucault was to theorize later. One of G. Beck's favorite chants was Kompa must go, a war cry against a non-West Indian professor whom he considered irrelevant to our purposes. I believe George made me a better reader of society and books, and he caused me to be more combative. I was drawn to the village of Papine before it was discovered. I would park up AW304 and walk to the rum shop, take in the secondary ganja smells, and watch mankind rig in by the jukebox. I used to listen for the Jamaican tone of voice that would help me to hear the writers better. From Papine village, a neat, well-dressed old man with an ancestral face came every week with lettuces and tomatoes and with many stories to tell. And there was Vel, or home help, an upright young woman who asked my permission to give the children ganja tea when they were getting the cold. Mel, whose beauty and character still live with us in the lignum vitae carving of her head and bust that was given to me by her boyfriend. At long last, I was meeting and living among the ordinary people of the Jamaican books I had encountered in the cold and the white. I gained a little notoriety at a certain conference by saying, not jokingly, maybe jokingly, but seriously too, that I was not about to fork up my criticism. I have never heard the people I met and moved with. I have never called them folks, those folks, the folk. They were never the folk to me. They were not a visiting, vanishing tribe of elusive Arawaks. They were the living stuff of the books I was reading. And they had a life in real life. And our writers showed that life. So now, back home, the university could not be an ivory tower as it tends to be when I work as a hired voice in other countries. But the college of the University of London now, the college I had come to, was in many ways an alien growth still under foreign tutelage. Section three, under the Banyan tree, describes some of the early years and activities that I was involved in. Early in January 1969, I was standing outside my office, admiring the roots of a spreading Banyan tree, preparing to go into my office, when the circumspect Edward Bohr came down the corridor, past the office of Professor Elsa Govaya, looked at the sign on my office door and said, half amused and half surprised, so you are inventing your own department now? I had not put it to myself like that, but he was right. I had taken off the sign that proclaimed me Dr. Kenneth Ramcha and English literature and replaced it with Kenneth Ramcha and literatures in English. That's how we got the name, literatures in English. Within two years, the old university English curriculum was dismantled and we were in fact, if not in name, 
literatures in English. We lived so in common law for a few years, after which a name change was solemnized. A few decades later, last year, an American university would make a big noise about how revolutionary they were because they were going to be the first university in the world, the world is America. They were going to be the first university to adopt the name literatures in English. I think we should have patented the name and raked in some hefty money to put in the vice chancellor's reparation kitty. 25 years ago, May the 8th, 1991, when I was invited to celebrate the 21st anniversary of the teaching of West Indian literature, I called the talk West Indian literature in the 90s, blowing up the canon. Today's generation of teachers and students might not realize what a little colonial enclave we were and why there had to be a revolution in the late 1960s and early 1970s. For those who never knew and to those who may have forgotten, this is what I found in 1969. The curriculum in English was like the curriculum of a British university in the provinces. It ran from Old English to Middle English up to Modern English, stopping at safely dead writers like T.S. Eliot and D.H. Lawrence. The teaching staff included West Indians, but on all three campuses, the English departments were run by non-West Indians, and a non-West Indian was close to be appointed professor and head of the department. Compa must go, I remembered. There was no full undergraduate course in West Indian literature. There was no course about, and there were no books from the Commonwealth, neither the Indian the black commonwealth, no, the prison, prisoner commonwealth. Maureen Warner was beginning African literature written in English, and there was a course in American literature. Those were little openings. There were one or two students doing postgraduate work for the MA degree, but there was no drive to encourage postgraduate studies in West Indian literature or in any other area. So in the 1991 lecture, I was able to boast, and you can read it on the screen, an academic discipline called West Indian literature had been established and it was the core element in the undergraduate program. Today I wonder if we have lost the idea of a core. The teaching staff is mostly West Indian. West Indian literature is taught at every level in the undergraduate program. Other literatures in English are an integral part of our offerings. West Indian literature is the main target of our postgraduate research. There is an annual conference. And instrumentally for me, West Indian texts have made their way officially into the secondary schools and our graduates were the teachers. The lecture, which looking at it, now I find it's quite a rag bag. 
the literature, the lecture also referred to a number of stirrings in the literary scene happening at the very least in parallel with what the department was trying to do. Highlighted in the talk also were brief resumes of the following. The emphatic re-entry of women's writing, and I say re-entry because when you read the early West Indian literary magazines and newspapers, there was not an absence of women. There were women editing magazines and writing stories and poems. But somehow or the other, after 1950, people didn't know about it. People did nothing about it. So the emphatic re-entry of women's writing, the growth in critical writings, the comeback of the short story, well, in order to get their stuff published in the 1950s and 1960s, West Indian writers were told, we don't want short stories, we want novels. So they kind of kept their short stories for later use. And that's why I talk about uh, the comeback of the short story, because the novel took over in the late 50s and the 1960s. And it was as if everybody had to write a novel and you just can't waste your time at the moment writing short stories. The comeback of the short story and developments in the analysis of orality as literature but very ominous in the writings and so different from what had come out in the 50s and early 60s, largely out of the inspiration of the federal experiment. Ominous in the writings was the disillusionment with the glorious political kingdom that had set in after the new day and the brighter sun of a very shameful independence that we slunk, in, slunk into island by island while the corpse of the Federation was still warm. Emphasis was placed on the work of Olive Senior for its exploration of what was called the orphan condition and the unanchoring of our societies and persons, for its creation of irrepressible female heroines and in its registering of violence and disrespect and the virtual rape of all the sanctities we knew. All of this informed the story, Country of the One-Eyed God, in which one recognized anger, the anger that had begun to settle in as the defining social characteristic of West Indian societies in the post-independence period. One of the themes of the presentation then was that British literature had been shifted from being at the center of our work in department and was now one of the literatures in English that we were reading and teaching. For me, this meant that at the undergraduate level we could invite our students to read and think about outstanding books and authors from nations that wrote in one of the new varieties of English that had become national languages. Some people refer to them as dialects of English, but I don't speak or write a dialect of English. I speak Trinidadian or West Indian English. That's what I read, right? That's what I talk, that's what I do, everything. These are languages, these are national languages. We had sufficient access to these literatures to feel their connections with us and with our society. So those were the things I tried to cover in that lecture. 
these defining features of our literary scene are taken for, gr for granted today. But it took some doing to bring us to this point. Enough had been going on to suggest that the time had come. But in all universities, academics find it hard to be born again. Some preferred a gradualist approach, and some actually said that we needed a period of preparation for independence. Preparation? Did they mean apprenticeship? When at St. Augustine, we were introducing the innovative MA by coursework and short dissertation that incidentally was quickly adopted by other departments in the Faculty of Arts. One of our members expressed the view that it was premature. The university authorities also probably thought so. They certainly thought it was a luxury or an indulgence, and they made it clear to me, I was head of department at the time, made it clear to me that we could do it, but there would be no additional funding. I want to remain with those exciting years. I've got the section four now called the hectic years. The first three sections are the longest section, so relief is coming. I want to stay with those exciting years on the Mona campus. When the student numbers for literature were rising, when students occupied the Creative Arts Center, when Wilson Harris agreed to come to Mona as a writer in residence, when reggae conquered the music kingdom, when at the conference of the Association for Common Literature and Language Studies hosted by us, one of my PhD students frightened V.S. Naipaul by shouting from the back of the room that he should be shot. It was a time when Netherford danced and Morris, Goodison, Scott, Wayne Brown, Eddie Bo, and McNeil sang, when Trevor Roan and the records were livening the theater scene, when Alex Gradusov and Sylvia Winter were running the Jamaica Journal, and Michael Manley was pretend preparing to be Joshua. I remember Carolyn Cooper, Gloria Lynn, Marjorie Furman, Rhonda Cobham, Wick Williams, Carl Wade, Dennis Scott, Rawson Adams, who didn't know that my secret source for understanding Wilson Harris, he thought I had books and I wasn't lending them to him, that my secret store for understanding Wilson Harris was reading the wretched books over and over and over again. That's what I do anyway. I, 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 I don't do book reviews. I find it very hard to talk about a book unless I read it about three or four times initially. And that is what I was doing with the Wilson Harris and giving him some insights. And he felt that there was some book somewhere that I was holding back from him. I remember to Timothy Callender, very fine short story writer. He told me that his chapters were written when he was high. And I didn't understand them. And that is why I said they were rubbish. But for me to understand them, I had to be high too. I said, okay, Timmy, bring the ganja. So I took a few puffs. You know, I said, that's enough now? He said, yeah, 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 you get in there. You'll be all right. I, afterwards, but Timmy, it is even more rubbish than before. I'm really getting more insight into this thing, boy. 
He said, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I never told the university that Timmy would never complete an academic degree, an academic research degree. I protected him and kept him on the books for two years and let him write his short stories and fragments of a novel. So I thus contrived to effect a first and probably only in the history of the University of the West Indies, I contrived to grant Timothy the UWI's first and only creative writing scholarship. In those days, there was my close association with Kamau. We were so close, he gave me a rare copy of Norman Cameron's two volume, The Evolution of the Negro. And we worked hard together. We founded the journal Sabaku, for which to correct the largely United Kingdom false record, for which I did a lot of the legwork, joint edited the first six issues, took part in planning future issues until my inputs were not needed anymore. I should make it clear that for a long time after the stillbirth of the West Indian Federation and up to now, my only consciously held ideology was that of being West Indian. It has always been so. So I get lashed from Indians, I get lashed from Africans, I get lashed from French people because I'm not in their party. I am a West Indian. If there were undiscussed ideological differences between myself and Kamai, Kamau, we were quite happy to work together for a free and unforced cultural poetics. Those who did not like what was beginning to happen, would you believe it, whispered about a Ramchan, the Brathwaite Axis. There were other malignant whisperers, and I found out that we were living in a small and insecure place. My life at Mona fixed me on a course that absorbed many tributaries, but never changed character. It made me understand that in the West Indian novel and its background, I was thinking about culture and society as if literature and the form of literature mattered. I think I was doing cultural studies with literary teeth. The conviction I had that literature is nothing if it doesn't reach people's minds and feelings, developed muscles in the year at Mona. I left for Trinidad in 1975, and my obsessions got worse. For 10 years, literature and the values of literature got introduced to the ordinary readers of my column, Matters Arising, in the Trinidad Guardian. People in the gallery who came to follow political debates in the Senate found themselves feeling the feelings that humanize the dry subjects in whose names politicians were playing draft to hold or gain power. To friends who kindly reminded me that I should be writing scholarly works or trying my hand at novels instead of wasting my time on outreach activities I could have said, everything we do under the sun is a waste of time. Or I could have referred them to my favorite philosopher, the poet of Ecclesiastes, who says, then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit 
there was no prophet under the sun. As the poet of Ecclesiastes himself finally declares, the greater wisdom lies in enjoying your work and while you are doing it, enjoying your work while you are doing it. So let's leave the universe for now and look at the university in part five to talk about where we are going wrong, in my opinion. So the first part of this is an attack on the semester system. If I were asked to suggest particular reasons for the decline in the numbers of students applying to do literatures in English, I would begin by looking at the semester system, which on the whole is very diseducating. The semester system which doubles the stress on students and teachers, and which by frequency adds more importance than ever to studying for examinations. Sometimes with four weeks ago, your teaching comes to a stop because students are only thinking of the imminent tests. I'm sorry to be an old foogie, harking back to what is lost. In the old days, you had a bunch of students for a whole year. You could watch them develop over the year. You got to know them, even their handwriting. I didn't have to check index numbers to know whose exam script I was. I knew all their handwritings. I knew who I was listening to when I was right, marking their exams. Most importantly, you got them to immerse in the literary text and discover over a whole year the joy and pain of immersion in literary works. The semester, on the other hand, like love these days, is one and done. And the student moves on, free to forget what has been got out of the way. At the worst, the system leads to a free-for-all and staff and students will be hard put to discover connections between the semester courses that are spread out before the students. To come to the point, with the introduction of the semester system, we have lost what I call the fiction of the core, the core that allowed us knowingly to embrace the illusion of a center that can hold. I don't think we have begun to measure the harm that this semester system has done. The second particular I would look at is the place of literature in the secondary schools. My work began there in 1966, before I came to the UWI with the publication of an anthology for teachers and students in schools. Remember, it wasn't being taught in the schools as yet, but I wrote this anthology to argue for it to be taught in the schools. And uh, I illustrated it with photographs of white writers who wrote about the West Indies and with extracts from them, and then followed it with photographs of our writers who were writing from our point of view about us. And I wanted to show that transition and to show certain continuities in the discourse. It put in a glossary of words and phrases you wouldn't find in the usual dictionaries and an appendix entitled Suggestions for Questions and Discussions that disavowed any purpose related to exams. It never crossed my mind that I should try to supply model answers. 
The book was honored with a preface, which is an unknown in another country. I asked the then Vice Chancellor, Sir Philip Sherlock, to write, which he did. The same Sir Philip, who I threatened like a good fidelista, that history would not absolve him if he did not agree to purchase at a ridiculously low price a manuscript that the author Wilson Harris was willing to sell to the West Indies. Thus, by impertinence, began the necessary project of gathering author's manuscripts at the UWI, which I had been told in writing the university does not do. The third issue I would list is the effect of economism in the world. And what I mean is clearly stated in Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, you see how old I am? Which entered my bloodstream decades ago. Schumacher gives me a good shortcut. This is what he said. An activity has been branded, if an activity has been branded as economic, its right to existence is not merely questioned, but energetically denied. Call a thing immoral or ugly, soul destroying or degradation of man, a peril to peace or to the well-being of future generations, as long as you have not shown it to be economic, you have not really questioned its right to exist, grow, or prosper. That is a challenge that has ever faced the arts and the humanities. And it is stronger now as the Third World War rages and civilizations are collapsing all around the globe. <laughs> you ever notice that instead of cleaning up the mess, the architects of doom are looking to evacuate the earth and head for the moon to continue killing lunatics, lovers, and poets? The fourth issue may sound contentious, but it is a fact that as teachers of literature, we have not sufficiently encouraged our students to pay serious attention to what John Stuart Mill referred to as the culture of the feelings. One day, Mill said just so and realized that a heavy regime of book learning was dehumanizing him. As teachers of literature, we have to check up on our own perspectives and our own relationship to the writings we teach. Only then can we begin to search for ways of teaching that might help our students to discover the culture of the feelings, to realize empathy and to see the need for the principle of equity to be operative at every level of society. And these are the pillars of humane living that have been turned into rubber by economism. And I'll come to the second to last section, section six, finding the lost literature. A teacher learns as he goes along, and he encourages his students to do the same. In a recent book called A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, that's why I bought it eh, for the title, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, George Saunders describes a master class that he conducts using the short story with a class of six students selected from between six and 700 applicants. 
He describes the chosen six as some of the best young writers in America. It is one of the most engaging books about reading and writing and teaching that I have seen. The seven stories chosen as texts are reproduced in the book along with the conversations with his students and with an appropriate amount of teeing up and summarizing by the professor. It is a book we all have a lot to learn from about teaching, reading, writing, society, and life. It is exactly the kind of proceeding I would like to see being carried out in relation to our literature. In an essay called The Lost Literature of the West Indies, I began with the physically lost literature that our researchers need to retrieve. But this turned out in the essay to be only a prelude to the more swelling theme that most of our literature is lost literature because it is not being read properly or taught properly or is not being fed into our society as a shaping force that can transform our lives and our society and the world. I drifted in my teaching towards using extracts from novels, as I did in West Indian novel, West Indian narrative, or using selected short stories from the piles I was gobbling up in the old defunct magazines and newspapers. This personal interest project began when I realized that you really needed to write a book about the evolution of West Indian prose. And the West Indian novel and its background was only part two. There was a part two to be done. I tried to raise interest by publishing an article claiming that most of the West Indian novels up to the 1960s, and even as late as Lovelace's The Dragon Can't Dance of 1979, most of these novels are collections of short stories in disguise. I'm not making joke now. I wasn't making joke then. I shall have more to say about this and about how much the native short story has shaped the less indigenous inherited novel form. It's not just that our novels, many of them are so episodic that they suggest they are short stories in disguise, but in other more profound ways about the art of storytelling and the relationship between reality and society and our particular lives, in many, many ways, the short story informs what I call the better West Indian novels today. So we leave that. And I just want to draw attention to one of the short stories in a book I've been projecting for the longest while. And I must do it before I die sometime in the next 20 years. So now I draw attention to one of the short stories in my projected, The Book of the West Indian Short Story. The story is called The Bridge and it's up on the screen. So those of you who weren't paying attention would have read it. The story is called The Bridge and was written by Janice Scheinborn. It is not flash fiction, though it has more life and poetry in it than flash fiction. With small groups of students, I had several times done with it, but with more economy and more concentration on language, I have done with it more or less what George Saunders does in a swim in a pond in the rain. The efficacy of the method is proved by the fact that I have worked it not with the best young writers in Trinidad, but with undergraduates who come to us from these same secondary schools that I criticize. From this story, 
the students inched up from just noticing or being struck by items in the text. And in the copy of the story that's on the screen, I have underlined most of the things that they volunteered that they wanted to talk about and notice and explore. And I know when we did that, we really got into the story. So they, the students, having the time with this short story, were able to concentrate a little bit and put their fingers on the things that impressed them or excited them or interested them. And then they were brave enough to talk about it and then for us to explore meanings. By the time we finished talking about the things they saw and were interested in, we were making tentative propositions about history. One little Indian boy said, oh, look at that, where's the white people house? And that is a cane factory. And Manik used to work in the cane, etc., etc. Little things like that came out, but there are big things. Propositions about history, culture, landscape, nature, love, life, loss, regret, death, and slow dying. They came up also with appreciations of how writing has the power to stir feelings and arouse thought. The best teaching is not telling people what to feel or think. Carrying exercises like these into extended fictions like whole novels or long short stories as bravely used by Saunders may call for some discreet plotting by a lecturer, but I have no doubt that the method produces an encounter that is truly teaching, an encounter that is much a learning experience for the lecturer as for the class. And now I come to the last section. This is really a plea. It's called punching above our weight. I want to refer to a British Academy report of September 2008 entitled Punching Our Weight, the Humanities and Social Sciences in Public Policy. The report notices firstly that government policy making has not benefited from the cross-departmental and free association ways of seeing and thinking to be found in literature and the humanities. It also notices that we do not take ourselves seriously as a professional and technical body with unique insights into human nature and human interactions and as visionaries with more capacity to imagine the shape of things to come than experts in any of the more mechanical disciplines. I think that the time has come for us to rise to the challenge and actively think of our work as having a major part to play in policy planning for the making of a better world. This requires finding a way to retain our free sensibility while negotiating its application to the problems of a troubled world. Einstein did not make the bomb, neither did he intervene to stop it. We have to intervene. I think we have a duty to find out who we really are and take definite steps to make saving interventions. I close with announcing that the proposed theme of the third international conference of Friends of Mr. Biswas is not punching our weight, but punching above our weight. 
And I do not see why this attempt to name our technological capacity and identify the areas in which we can, as public intellectuals, contribute to social policy, why this cannot be done in collaboration with the UWI, the UTT, and other tertiary institutions in the region. And this I now propose. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramchand, for that insightful, sometimes provocative, always uh, informative and interesting and engaging lecture that went through the, the history, the past of uh, establishing West Indian literature as a discipline at UWA Mona and look back to, looked back at your life as well and demonstrated how the two were so closely intertwined. I, I was glad to hear that before you taught a book, you had to read it three or four times because I, I find that that's what I have to do as well. I have not yet tried taking a puff of ganja to give me greater insight in, into my students' assignments. Um, I'll, I'll take that into consideration. <laughs> but... Um, Thank you so much for, for that lecture, Professor Ramchand. We have been monitoring the chat on YouTube, and there are a few questions which I'm going to read because I, I know that you um, may not be able to see the YouTube chat. So I am going to read them for you one by one. And we have a question from uh, Professor Evelyn O'Callaghan. Um, who I'm sure you know, and who was recent, who recently retired as dean from the Cave Hill campus. And Professor Callahan asked, "Do you think that we have gone to an extreme in virtually ditching canonical writing to concentrate on post-colonial literature?" For sure, for sure, because I, I really don't abide by many of these definitions. I, I look at great books and interesting books and books that make me feel something. And, and so if I had to define it, yes, we have indeed gone too far in you know, discarding all that has gone before and looking at what? What did you say? Post what? Post-colonial. Well, you see, that's the other thing. Um, I agree with her. But with the proviso that there is nothing post-colonial, we are still being colonized. So, but I agree with her position or with the question, yes, it is true that we are doing what she thinks we are doing. Okay, thank you. And a question from Isis Samaj Hall, who is a lecturer in the Department Literatures of English here at Mona. Uh, Professor Ramchand, can you talk a bit more about the power of naming and renaming in the West Indian context? Well, we could talk about that for a whole day. But, um, you know that um, poem in Bratton where, where the, the protagonist says, I'm a fucking Negro man? Now, you'll be named as something by the people who don't like you or who want to oppress you. And we really do have to find out who we are and rename ourselves. It is a whole social and political process in which we are involved. And if we don't do it, and if we don't consciously do it, and I don't mean stupidness like the empire writes back. That's, I don't care about writing back to the empire. I care about writing to ourselves. And the only way in which we can name ourselves is write to ourselves. And that is why I think it is so important that our literary works and our art, you know, that these have to be consumed and digested by our ordinary people. 
sorry to be so brief, but um, I think time may be running out. Mm -hmm. We're we're good for time. Um, Dr. Samaj Hall has sent a number of questions. I'm just going to ask um, one more of hers uh, because it was something that that was, uh, you know, that I was thinking of as well. Um, but I'll ask one more of hers before I go on to um, another question that has been posted by someone else. Uh, but she says, Professor Ramchand, if those were the exciting years of bold voice and intellectual and cultural confidence at Mona that you spoke about. How would you describe the campus now? I haven't been there for the longest while. Um, I've seen the reading lists and syllabuses. I know the numbers have fallen. I know the staff numbers have gone down too. And from the outside, I would say things are in a very sad way. Unless things are going on underground that will erupt one of these days. That tends to happen a lot and you think nothing, nothing is going on and then suddenly things begin to come out. It, it, probably it's true that they're always going on and we take notice of them eventually. So on the surface, I think that those days that we had, they were still the West Indian days. People were still hankering after West Indianness. We were still federal. We were still non-parochial in our approach to the cricket. We still believed in the University of the West Indies. If the other campuses had started, we, didn't regard, we just regarded them as colleges of the We felt we belong to a university or could belong to a university. And we had some characters, we had personalities. I mean, you know how, how what felt like to walk down the corridor and see Elsa Govai at her desk and go in and talk to her. If she was a younger lady, I would have kissed her and hugged her. You go and you sit down there and talk to her. And you know, it's almost you're good for a week after that conversation. And you had Kamau, and you, you know, you had called George Irish. We had a whole set of personalities and experts, Professor Hall, Roy Auger, you know, um, you'd go down to the senior common room and you'd meet these people. And then the students, the students were very proactive. When they occupied the Creative Arts Center, what they were saying is that this thing here is a whited sepulchre. It was intended for our use and to the development of the arts, and you're not doing it, right? And they took it over. So, yeah, I, I think everybody says that the old days will never come back. Their old days will never come back. Um, I don't want to already put both mouth on, on the present, but I do think that um, there are conditions in the world and conditions with technology, and conditions with social media, and conditions of the politicians, you know, about. and there is this anger, anger, anger that you see everywhere that um, these people are writing secret diaries and producing manuscripts, which, which will be published after the riots are over. I don't know. It, 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 it's a sad time. Yeah, I, I, I guess that, um, you know, that part of my um, questioning about, you know, what are we now had to do with um, not even only the campus, but uh, the kind of wider society, that, that anger you talk about. But, I, I mean, you were very clear about the moment we were at in the 70s. What, what moment are we at now? And what is the cause? Is there a cause? And, you know, when I think of the campus today, no, I mean, I'm not even on the campus at this moment. Uh, COVID has intervened, uh, all of the changes of COVID, and the campus is quite empty. Um, and not only because teaching has ended, but because students are studying from home. And we, we have some students who, um, for the majority of the years, they spend at the UWI 
um, that learning will be done from home. And, and, you know, the kind of impact that has uh, a sense of a lack of community, of gathering, of sitting under the tree and, you know, exchanging ideas, of, of that kind of personal interaction, um, that is surely something that, that will affect their thinking and um, their development. Um, okay, so let me go to. Uh, sorry, did you? Were no, you coming? No, I'm sorry, I agree with you. I mean, it's, I find it um, on on my off days. I find it very depressing, you know. And uh, I remember a Walcott line, which I it's hard to say, but yeah, when you say it, you really do it. Hold hard, heart. You know, <laughs> you have to keep telling yourself, hold hard, heart. You know, um, I really I, I worry about my grandchildren and my great grandchildren. You know, what kind of world are they coming into? And I can't say that they will develop fangs to live in this world, as you, we said. You know, you develop. If you develop fangs, you're turning beasts, right? So I don't want them to turn beasts. So. Yes, and um, I, I mean, what I would say is, is I, I, I wonder about that world as well. Um, but surely, uh, I, I think that it would be a far more uh, dangerous world or a far poorer world without the study of literature and the other disciplines of the humanities. And, uh, you know, that's, that is why it remains so necessary and so vital to the development and growth of our society. Let, Indeed, let me turn, the, sorry. What the COVID thing, the COVID, COVID, out of evil cometh good. Eh? People are locking down and reading. I would like to know what they are reading. Because if we are all forced to lock down and read literary literature, <laughs> real literature, if you are all, and not just passing the time and getting quick thrills. If we all locked down for two years and gave ourselves a course in the arts and humanities, I mean, there's so many images. You could soon visit so many art galleries and read so many. But maybe after the two years when COVID gone, a cloud would have lifted and we are different people, maybe. Well, but let us hope for that. Let, let me turn to another question, uh, Prof. Uh, Cornell Bogle, who uh, is a graduate of the department, um, now pursuing postgraduate studies abroad, uh, he writes, in your writing, you express a distrust of Euro-American criticism, and that's in quotes. Why is that? And what's the role of West Indian criticism today, especially as Caribbean literature has grown in recognition globally? Um, I object to um, Euro-American theoretical influences because I have found many of our students and many of the students of literature get stuck in talking about the theories. I once went to um, uh, a reception where I met a very eminent theorist and I said to her, I always wanted to ask you, have you ever come to the end of reading a poem? Or have you ever read a whole novel? Because I formed the impression that once you find the line or the moment that ties in with your obsessions, the book becomes that for you. And you are not telling anybody about that book anymore. About that, poem. and you are not even exposing yourself to the experience of the poem. And then this person said, "Oh, isn't that wonderful that we two Orientals are here having a drink of wine and sparring over the value of Edward Said?" Because earlier on, I had told her how wonderful Edward Said was, you know, in my opinion. Um, I, th I think the Euro-American theory may fit Euro or America, but they don't fit our stuff. I designed a course in, at the University of the West Indies um, on critical theory, West Indian critical theory. 
had all kinds of things on Lam Ning and Hussein Mati and all, all, all the writers, what they had to say about writing and what they're up to. And I turned my back for one year. And when I came back, the replacement teacher from abroad had changed my syllabus utterly. My thing had disappeared without a trace. And it was a kind of critical theory program you would have found in an American university. And there were poor little students stuffing this thing. So my problem with Euro-American thing is that I just don't want it to be something that dominates us. It mustn't be something that we feel we have to follow. That I, I think we should know our own critical and social and cultural traditions and get our own bearings for ourselves. And then, because... I spent so much time reading about structuralism and only because I wanted to be able to say that don't apply to me or I'm not interested. I can't tell you I'm not interested in it if I don't read it. So some of it may have rubbed off on me for my betterment, maybe, but um, I just don't want them to be a major influence on my intellectual processes. I mean, one chapter of a book by C.L.R. James opens up my mind more. Something from John Jacob Thomas, something from George Lamming, you know, something from Gordon Euler, from Eddie Bow, something from Mervyn. Lots of, we have, have a saying thing, nature of literature and the literary experience. And that is what our, and, and that comes out of their experience of living here and being here and being aware of how the craft is practiced in other countries and then finding their own way. So I'm very heavy on finding our own way. The second part of the question, I think that's, I hope you'd realize that that is very implicit in the whole talk um, about how, um, what is the second part of the question? What, what's the role of West Indian criticism today, especially yes. as Caribbean literature has grown yes. in recognition globally? Yeah. yeah um, you see, if I, if I write something about Thomas Hardy's The Mayor of I think is a very West Indian novel. Or if I write a novel about Jude the Obscure, and I say about Jude, which is a very West Indian book or great expectations. If I write about them, I write it for people here. When I go abroad, if I ever do a lecture on, on these subjects, the students are delighted because I'm coming with my own perspective. But I have no illusion that they're going to take my way of reading the book as the way of reading the book that makes it live for them. But it certainly gives them a jolt and makes them see how wonderful it is that this book which we love and care for is seen in such and such a way by people with a different experience. And that, to me, that's wonderful. So, so, so our criticism, I think, really should serve our society in the first instance. And if we have something to say, I mean, I, I have to read Huckleberry Finn a few more times before I die. I, I, I keep reading the Bible all. There are great books, you know. I read in Shakespeare all the time. There, there, there are great books in England and America and in translation from other things, which I live and love. But um, I really swear by the literature of my own country because without even thinking, Without thinking, without imagining, without looking for notes. When he says tamarind tree, I see the tamarind tree, I smell it, I taste the tamarind, right? Everything happens to me, just the word, the name tamarind tree is magical for me. When I read oak, so oh shit, what does that oak look like there again? Check up on oak again. Ah. Massive things. So I don't have, I don't need intermediate, I don't even need any intercession between me and the text. And also, I am able to find things 
in the interstices of Caribbean texts. The, the author himself didn't know was there. You know, many times when I talked to a Western writer about something, he said, well, I didn't mean that, you know, I did not, but you're right, look at there, it's true. That, you know, um, because no writer, no writer can know everything about what he has written. And they look to us for finding things. So I'm talking about the writer now. The writer himself is in dialogue with the better critics. And the, the society should be, and it's our fault, we should find ways of addressing our ordinary people. I can tell you politically, you're not going to get rid of the politicians unless you have a thinking and sensitive population who will know that those fellas are rubbish. Of course, those fellas are not interested in developing an education system that is going to create a public that will kick them out of office. So there's a big tussle going on that we now, as fellas in the middle, we really have to address the ordinary people of this country and these countries and let them see that the great philosophers of our nation, the great philosophers of our nation are these writers and painters and so on. And if you listen to them, you will find yourself in them and then you could become real persons in the world. So I take the function of the critic at the present time, as I said in the thing, you know, my job is to let people know these things exist and to let them ex be, help to expose them to it and then encourage them to explore it. I don't really want to get published in this Sewani review or anything like that. Not again, I finish with that now, no, I got all my promotions. So I could kick the base degrees by which I did ascend. You know, I, I can now enjoy talking and reading and writing about literature, nobody could deny me tenure or anything, no. That is a wonderful place to be. Thank <laughs> you for speaking so frankly. Let, let me just but go it's on. nearer to, to death than you realize, though. Sorry? It, it has a, a bad oh. side to it. It is nearer to your entry to heaven. <laughs> okay, I recognize that. Okay, let, let me go on to the final question. Um, we, we do have another segment of the event that we want to move on to. So I'll just make this the last question. And Michael de Graff asked, Professor Ramchand, please advise what to do to promote our national languages as truly, so especially in our schools. As a Haitian Creolist, I'm especially concerned by this colonial challenge? Yes, I, I think um, it's, um, we, it's a hard, hard thing to do, as, um, especially in the schools. But once again, I think this is where our literature has a major part to play. For in our literature, one thing, um, one of my theories about the thing is that I go all the time for the Jamaican tone of voice, for the Trinidadian tone of voice. I don't care how you spell the dialect and what kind of orthography you develop for it, but you've got to hear that language. Now, if we hear it, you're going to find that in the so-called English or standard English, we don't talk standard English. In that, what we call our standard English, you listen to the West Indian tone of voice and you notice that all the tones from the so-called dialects, all the sounds, moving Allen wrote about this, the, the sounds, the language that is spoken by ordinary people, the sounds feed into 
our educated registers. And therefore, that continuum, that continuum exists. And I think the first thing our teachers and students in schools have to know is that the continuum exists. If you want to use the word Creole, that is the Creole language. The whole continuum is the Creole. The, the level of it that people refer to as a dialect and sometimes as the Creole and so on, to me, that level is not the Creole. The whole thing is the Creole. If we can establish that, that the whole language from the usage of educated West Indians right down to the usage of ordinary people, that there's a continuity between them, then we can begin to tackle the problem of teaching the language in the schools. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramchand. And thank you for your very uh, full responses to those interesting questions. We move on now to the, uh, uh, the next segment of our event. Uh, we couldn't talk about teaching West Indian literature without hearing from those who have learned West Indian literature. You know, nowadays we talk about teaching and learning, not just the teaching. So the next uh, segment of the event is a conversation with three of our graduates, three of the department's graduates, about what learning West Indian literature has meant to them. Participating in the conversation are Professor Emeritus Carolyn Cooper, who graduated in 1971 from the Department of Literature in English. And of course, uh, Professor Cooper was one of the students who sat in that first class in West Indian literature that Professor Ram Chan taught. We also have uh, one of our graduate students, Mr. Paul Codner, who graduated in 1993 with the BA in Literature in English and he's currently in our PhD program. And Miss Yashika Graham, a poet and a very recent graduate, she received her degree in literatures in English in 2020. Mm. Welcome, Professor Carolyn Cooper, Mr. Paul Codner, and Miss Yashika Graham. Thanks for participating in this brief conversation about your experiences studying West Indian literature. Let me ask you first, and, and I'm going to Professor Cooper first, as one of the members of the first class on West Indian literature, just to tell me a little about your experience studying West Indian literature, what it was like being one of the first students to do a course in West Indian literature and what that meant for you in terms of your personal, intellectual, and cultural development. Well, it was a wonderful experience. We were studying our own literature for the first time. And I really have to big up Professor Kenneth Ramshan for having had the vision to introduce this course in West Indian fiction, the novel. It was what we were focusing on. And I am very happy to say that I still have my essay from that course. I don't know what? if you can see. 50 years, <laughs> 51 years, and 51 wow. years and three months later. It is one of my prized possessions. Okay. Wow. And it was an essay. It was an essay on Wilson Harris. And you must hear the title. Wilson Harris, Myth and Symbol as a Primary Motifs of a West Indian Fictional Genre. They now have square brackets. An explication of Palace of the Peacock provides the material from which a generalization on Harris's oeuvre might be obtained. Now, this is, I'm a year and a half into my degree, and you're hearing Ooh. enoughness. But I tell you, Ram Chan was a brilliant teacher. And listen to the comment on the essay, which now you ask about the formative impact of that course. Ram Chan wrote, this is a remarkably sensitive and intelligent response to a difficult novel. The courage with which you quote and interpret is especially admirable. And that courage 
is something that has characterized my academic career. And I want to thank Ken for recognizing the courage and nurturing it. And if I have a chance, I'll talk some more about the other teachers of West Indian literature who inspired me. So, you know, that was just a formative experience taking that course. And of course, me enough, me I write about Harris. Everybody is <laughs> the palace of the peacock. And me say, no, sir, me not that. <laughs> so the courage is what I take away from that course. Well, well, I don't know if the experiences of our other two graduates could match that. But Paul, <laughs> Paul and Yashika, what was it like for you studying West Indian literature here at Mona? Well, mm. go oh, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say that for me, studying Western, West Indian literature between 1989 and 1993 prepared me to go out in the world because Dr. Cooper asked me, where, I, where am I now? <laughs> and I'm in Jamaica. I was a migrant who subsequently found his way home to meet the world that I already carried within myself as a West Indian. In the pleasures of exile, Laming describes West Indians as the most cosmopolitan people in, on planet Earth. And studying West Indian literature prepared me to negotiate issues of racial, ethnic, cultural, and other differences that I in inevitably confronted when I migrated to the United States. I already, I already lived many of those issues through the literary works, which gave me insights into how to accommodate myself to cultural differences and resist cultural impositions. So I would say that I think about studying West Indian literature in the same way that Selvan thought about his Trinidad when he said the following, quote, the island substitute West Indian literature is my shadow and I carry it with me wherever I go and my roots are the same as a mango tree or an immortal, unquote. That's ways of sunlight. West Indian literature gave me the necessary grounding to live in the world. Yashika, what about you? Hmm. Uh, well, studying West Indian literature for me has meant to a great degree meeting myself in text, uh, which when the, the department would have been centered on literature of England would not have had so much of that. Uh, but it was very interesting for me to see the language and to see languages like Patwa, like Gola, for example, when we studied um, Daughters of the Dust. And though this is not a West Indian text, so to speak, there's a way that the West, studying West Indian literature has meant studying the literature of the world. And so we get just a vast um, exposure to ourself and ourselves. And I think that that has been very central for me, as well as um, giving me tools with which to tussle with our position as West Indian people, that dislocative quality and the, 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 the trying things, but also the beautiful things. So the tools, I've fallen in love with writing essays and, you know, this kind of thing. So it has been beautiful. It has been difficult. It has been, it has centered me, I think, inside of my experience as a West Indian. Carolyn, that, that first class in West Indian literature, I, I know, of course, you were in it. Um, people like Dennis Scott were in that course. Um, can you tell me a little about the other students in that class and, and what it was like um, interacting with these uh, different students in that course? Well, at the time, the department was much more Caribbean. So you had students from all over the region from Guyana, from Trinidad, from um, St. Lucia. And so it was, a, it was really a West Indian course in the sense that it wasn't just Jamaican. It was really an introduction to the region. And all of the students brought their own insights to the course. So you had people like Catherine Broadbow, um, Sandra Passard, um, Angela Marshall from Guyana. Sandra was from Trinidad. And, Robert Lee from St. Lucia. So we had a, a nice mix and I think we interacted very well. There were only about 11 or 12 of us doing English special, you know, as it was at the time. So it was a very intimate class and, and we learned from each other. Uh, for, for the more recent graduates, um, 
what happens in the, the department now is that we study West Indian literature um, through different genres. So we might do a course in West Indian drama, a course in the West Indian novel, a course in West Indian poetry. Uh, but do you have, Yashika and then Paul, do you have any um, memorable experiences in those courses that you would like to, to talk about or mention? Hmm. Maybe, maybe West Indian poetry. We looked at, um, Dr. Buckner t taught me, and we looked at, among others, Dion Brand, Grace Nichols. Uh, and I do remember encountering the word trace while we were doing, I think, Grace Nichols, um, because there is a, a quality in, I think, Nichols' work where it's like unpacking a person. That's the the formal term, but in Jamaica, when you trace off somebody, you tell them about themselves. But encountering it in class as a formalist kind of, you know, term, it blew me away to say we were, I was sort of meeting, meeting us again in academic terms to, to observe that we were always using this kind of language. We were always doing this kind of work and we might not think of it as academic or as you know intelligent work necessarily, but all of a sudden I was um, coming to terms with that and with the, the beauty of what we are. So that is something that I, I remember and I hold on to. Paul, what about you? Uh, I would say that I remember studying West Indian, in studying West Indian literature, how incredibly down to earth and invested in our development as thinkers and as writers or lecturers were. You know, one never got the sense that they were trying to push any particular way of thinking or ideological agenda, as one sometimes gets in, in metropolitan spaces. You know, rather, you know, you sense that you know, our lecturers were there to guide us to make sense of our worlds um, by thinking and writing about imaginative literature that spoke directly to our experiences by creating images of ourselves and our societies. You know, and I was just blown away um, as an undergraduate. You see, I started as a part-time student in 1989. So I straddled um, the year-long courses and the, you know, the semester systems because I started part-time and I, you know, straddled both systems. But I remember my first class in E100 where I got formally introduced to West Indian literature. It, it was a course that was taught by, I think everybody in the, in the department taught a book. And I remember Carolyn Cooper, um, she, she, she taught Tijan and his brothers in that, I don't remember the room, it's that room upstairs, kind of sideways to, to, to the Never Hall Lecture Theatre. You know, I don't remember the name of the room, but I remember Carolyn Cooper, when she came in, you know, Carolyn Q. Cooper, you know, focuses attention on the room with her style, you know, you know her both sartorial and verbal, right? You know, and, you know it was just amazing to, to, to interact with these incredibly learned persons who were so down to earth. I remember decided to walk us through um, what the twilight says and overture, which for, as you can imagine, undergraduate students was, you know, extremely difficult. But she, you know, she just really broke it down and made it, you know, to us, you know. West Indian novel was, you know, Nadi taught me. Nadi was like, Nadi knew everything. <laughs> you know, I wrote an essay on Palace of the Peacock, like Dr. Cooper, you know, because I decided to challenge myself like, like her, you know, and Nadi had a reputation of being an incredibly hard marker. But, I, you know, I said to myself, I need to challenge myself. You know, and I wrote this essay and I managed to get a name. Imagine that from Nadi. <laughs> and <laughs> the, the, the thing... The thing that struck me is that Nadi, in his comments, actually said to me that I should make sure that I quote my sources properly. And he mentioned a critic by the name of Hena Mace Yelenik, um, 
or something like that. But I had never actually read 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 it. So I said, boy, I must be well bright, you know, because <laughs> I never read them. So that means that I'm doing something right. So I didn't even mention it to him. I took it as a compliment, you know. <laughs> First time I say anything about it, you know. But generally, you know, I remember being taught by Dr. Chang, God rest his soul, Gloria Lin, who was my first tutor, you know. You know, and they all had their unique personalities, but all had this sense of investment in, you know, in our development as thinkers, you know, and that is what remains with me. Can I just pick up on that comment by Paul? Well, I, I was going to say, I'm going to give you the last word, so go ahead. Uh, no, well, I, I have to say that, I, Paul, I used to have great contempt and disdain for the critics because my position was, me could have read a book by myself, so we don't know whatever they tell me what we don't know. <laughs> Fortunately, I grew out of that, you know. <laughs> But there was a sense in which you just really wanted to challenge yourself to see what you could come up with. And I have to big up Maureen Warner Lewis for her work on oral tradition. That was important for my career. Mervyn Morris for Louise Bennett. Um, Gon Roller for um, Calypso. And Eddie Ball, who we're honoring today for his work on Walker, because it is because of Eddie that I did my PhD on Walker. And I'd like to think of my trajectory in terms of a spectrum from Palace of the Peacock to Palace of the Peacock to Dance Hall of the DJs, you know. So our department has broadened the conception of what West Indian literature is, the oral describer, the full range. And I really want to big up the people who went before us, who set the pace and made it possible for all of us now to come true. Thank you for that, Caroline. And of course, the Nadi that Paul refers to is none other than Dr. Norval Edwards. Thank you all of you for participating and for telling us a little about your experiences. I, I know that we could say much more, but of course, we are constrained by time. Thank you. Thanks for having us. That was Carlin Cooper, Paul Codner, and Yashika Graham talking about what it's like studying literature and studying West Indian literature at, at the University of the West Indies, Mona. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our event. I want to thank you all for logging on and listening and sharing this wonderful event, this wonderful lecture with us. Uh, just if you would allow me to say a few thank yous. Um, first of all, to our office staff, Antoinette Jackson and Whitney Eaton, uh, who worked so hard behind the scenes, even though we're online, we still have behind the scenes, but who really worked hard behind the scenes uh, to do all the work necessary to put in on this event. And thank you as well to our uh, senior administrative assistant, Mrs. Gordon, Denise Gordon Francis. Thank you to Lisa Brown for giving such an insightful and impactful introduction for Professor Ramchand. And thank you to Norval Edwards and Kevon Bailey for assisting with the research for that introduction. Uh, thank you to MIT, the, the section and which broadcast our event on uh, Mona Multimedia and to Mr. Ishmael Preston in particular. Thank you to uh, Professor Cooper, Mr. Codner and Ms. Graham for that delightful conversation about learning West Indian literature. And I have to give uh, a special thank you to Professor Cooper. It was her who reminded us a few years ago that the uh, 50th anniversary of the first class in West Indian literature was upon us. And it was she who urged us to do something to um, commemorate the occasion. And uh, we're thankful that she did and that she um, very often, um, you know, brings these important markers and occasions to our attention. So thank you, Caroline. 
thank you, of course, a big thank you to Professor Ramchand for delivering such a thoughtful, interesting, insightful lecture. Much room for thought there. A fitting tribute to Mark, 50 plus years of teaching uh, West Indian literature. Thank you all again for logging on and attending, uh, for your questions and for participating. It was our pleasure to host the 14th Edward Ball Distinguished Lecture and to provide you with this midday feast for your thoughts. Thank you.